Hi, I'm Larissa Pelthorpe. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh, more specifically the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh. And I work on discovering new small planets and then characterizing them. So essentially working out what they're made of, what type of planet they are. Uh, so earlier this year, we discovered Gliese 12b, and I was the co-lead of the team, along with another person, Shashir, um, in Australia. And essentially, the way we went about this is through transits. And to discover an exoplanet through the transit method, basically what you do is you point a telescope at a star for an extended period of time. And if there's a planet orbiting around the star and it passes in front of it, in our line of sight, we get a dip in the amount of light we receive. Uh, from the star and the depth of that dip is the size of that planet and so it was a big NASA telescope survey that kind of first identified this as a possible planet the TESS survey um, but the problem with TESS is that it only stares at stars for 28 days at a time so if a planet is orbiting longer than that then you don't always pick it up um, but essentially TESS also has data gaps uh, in which it reorientates to transmit data back to the planet. So we thought there was a planet there, but we didn't know how long its orbital period was. So how long it takes to go around the star. Um, and that is very important for determining things like habitability. So we either thought it was kind of 12 days or we thought it was double that 24 days. And so we wrote a proposal to the European Space Agency and used one of their telescopes called CHAOPS. And from that, we were able to determine um, that it was a 12 day period planet. So that's how long a year is on that planet. Um, and then we also had a load of other telescopes get involved as well, just to kind of verify the detection. So we had Minerva, which is in Australia. We had the Purple Mountain Observatory, which is in China. Uh, and with all that data, we were basically able to say that, yeah, there's a planet there. It's about one Earth radius um, and it orbits every 12 days. So basically there are different types of stars and they're different temperatures and the habitable zone is basically the distance at which a planet can orbit and there can be liquid water on its surface. Uh, so if a planet was orbiting too close to a hot star, then it would be kind of steam. And if it was orbiting too far out, then it would be ice. And the way we define habitability in kind of the astrophysics world is liquid water. And it's nicknamed the Goldilocks zone because as you know from the story of the porridge, too hot, too cold, just right. Um, so the Goldilocks zone around a star is the just right zone for liquid water to exist. And Gliese 12b kind of exists on the inner side of the habitable zone. So it's kind of maybe a little bit too hot, maybe just right, um, more information is needed currently. But uh, yeah, habitable zones shift as well, depending on the type of star, because again, there's different temperatures, but uh, that's it in a nutshell, essentially. There's another method called um, radial velocities. And essentially the way that works is the Doppler effect, which is the same effect that makes a um, ambulance sound different when it's coming towards you versus going away from you. It's kind of little wobbles, it shifts the wavelength. And essentially the way the radial velocity method works is that again, we are kind of looking at the star because we can't see the planets directly because they're so far away and they don't emit their own light. Um, but essentially as a planet is orbiting around the star is it shifts kind of the wavelength of the light we receive. We, there are little wobbles in the light we receive. And from the kind of how big those shifts are, we can tell the mass of the planet. And so using the mass from radial velocities and the radius from transits, we can work out the density of the planet. And that can tell us a lot about the interior structure of the planet. There are mathematical equations for that. Um, there are methods of direct imaging exoplanets, but very few are kind of able to be directly imaged because they're so far away. And there's a lot of other things that come into play. And even then, they're kind of so, so small that you really can't tell that much. Um, but also the transit method as well. So as I said, when the planet's orbiting around the star and it passes in front of it, and if the planet has an atmosphere, any light we receive kind of goes through the atmosphere and kind of certain chemicals elements are absorbed at certain wavelengths. If we, when we get the light from the star, we split it into certain wavelengths. So we can tell um, what elements are kind of present in that planet's atmosphere, which can teach us a lot about habitability again. Uh, yeah. 
So the James Webb Space Telescope, um, which is kind of NASA's newest tool, it's been been out in orbit for a couple of years now. So we're hoping to do kind of transmission spectroscopy with it, which is essentially what I was just talking about. It's um, when the planet's transiting, um, the light passing through the atmosphere. And from that, we'll be able to tell a lot more about the planet. Essentially, right now, we don't know if it has an atmosphere just from the transits we have. We haven't broken down the transmission spectroscopy kind of into that method. Um, and because the planet sits on the inner, inner edge of the habitable zone, so it might be slightly too warm to be um, kind of habitable, we'll be able to tell from the elements that we detect in the planet's atmosphere whether it actually is, because uh, it's kind of straddling right now between Earth and Venus. and both Earth and Venus. Venus used to have water, Earth obviously still does. Um, but there was a runaway greenhouse effect on Venus that meant that it lost all its water and so it's not habitable. And if we're able to kind of detect water in the planet's atmosphere, then we'll be able to tell whether it's more like Earth or more like Venus. And in turn, that can teach us a lot about how our own solar system developed and why Earth remained habitable, but Venus did not. Uh, well, I actually went on a school trip to Iceland when I was about 14 and Iceland doesn't have a high population so there's not a lot of light pollution and all the stars you could see there kind of just amazed me. You could see the Milky Way and so many shooting stars. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see the Northern Lights there. Um, but that kind of really inspired me to want to work in space. Uh, and then I went into astrophysics uh, because actually it's a funny story. Um, I didn't really want to go to university, but my mum thought I should. And so I said, if I'm going to go to university and spend all this money, then I'm going to do a subject I'm not very good at. <laughs> and physics was my worst subject at school. Uh, now it's obviously my best subject because I've spent about seven years doing it. Uh, but that's kind of what led me into astrophysics, a passion for the stars and also trying to prove my mum wrong.